Good morning, everyone. My name is Ulf Svadrup. I'm the director of the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you this morning to, uh, I think, a very important seminar on environment of peace and environment and peace. Um, almost two years ago, in the middle of the pandemic, um, some uh, exciting researchers from our Swedish sister institute, CIPRI, uh, led by them, and an international team of scholars, one of them also Cedric de Koning, participating, started a journey to map out uh, the relationship between uh, environment and environmental challenges, and uh, peace and security. Um, the, this expert committee, based on science, social sciences and other disciplines, were supported by an uh, international panel of leading experts. Uh, Margot Wallström uh, has been a very prominent, strong uh, leader, dedicated her time and intellectual leadership into this report. I've been fortunate enough to sit as one of the members, to sit in and uh, try to track some of the processes and learn a lot. It's been a great uh, exercise. And uh, just uh, a few weeks ago, no, no, so beginning of June, this beautiful report, Environmental Peace, Security in a New Era of Risk, was published. It was published in Stockholm, uh, linking back to the Stockholm Declaration as well. So, and today uh, we are uh, meeting here to discuss and to hear some of the key arguments put forward in this report. Um, uh, the, and uh, we are fortunate, as I said, to have Margot Wallström to present the, the report and the key uh, contributions of it. And then uh, we will have uh, Cedric de Koning, um, a, a senior researcher, a research professor here at, uh, at NUPE, to, to say a few words about uh, some of the linkages and some of the uh, paragraphs in, in particular. And then uh, towards the end, uh, we will have uh, Hans Olav, who's the, the, I would say, a very dedicated expert uh, in the minist Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who have been working over many years to establish the link between environment, climate, and security, and peace, and also how to position Norwegian foreign policy in this new thing. So, uh, and uh, I must say that uh, Norway's thinking about uh, energy, climate, environment, and peace and security, and foreign pol policy would not have been the same without the contributions of Hans Olaf. So it's fantastic that he is here. He will replace State Secretary uh, Henrik Thune, who otherwise would, uh, as according to the program, would have made uh, these uh, remarks. So it's great to have you here, Hans Olaf. Uh, and after uh, these introductory remarks, we will have a Q&A session. Let me also uh, remind you that this seminar is streamed. So welcome to all of you who follow, on, uh, follow us on the stream. So on that note, uh, Margot, uh, thank you so much for your leadership in uh, this, uh, preparing this report. It's great that you ha uh, have traveled to Oslo to come and share the thoughts and results with us. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and uh, thank you for inviting me and it's a true pleasure to be here in person, to be able to travel by train from Karlstad to here and to meeting all of you and also to uh, all of you who are uh, following online. Uh, thank you for participating. Actually, I was thinking that we should start by showing a, a two-minute uh, video that sets out sort of the main content of this report and, and then I, I will come back to say a few words. Insecurity and conflict are on the rise. Human activity is putting the natural environment under more stress than ever before. It is an increasingly toxic mix. The number of armed conflicts around the world has doubled in just 10 years. So has the number of people displaced from their homes. Spending on arms is increasing. Global hunger is growing. 
At the same time, environmental crises are adding new risks to security. Drought leads to failed crops, floods force people from their homes, ocean ecosystems die. The twin security and environmental crises are creating new, complex risks and compromising our prospects of achieving and maintaining peace. The result? A new era of risk. Unless we take action, the situation will only get worse. There is a way forward. It is possible to build the foundations of a new security, and it begins by acknowledging that we need to tackle the twin crises together. We must address the root causes of the environmental crisis. Cutting carbon emissions quickly, reducing pollution, restoring forests, protecting nature. However, solutions meant to address environmental issues can have unintended negative impacts on peace and security. We must enable a green transition that is both just and peaceful, with policies that avoid sparking new opposition or conflicts. Governments need to switch spending from things that fuel the twin crises, such as building their armed forces and fossil fuel subsidies, to activities that restore the environment and build peace. Environmental integrity and peace are inextricably linked. By addressing them together, we ensure that measures aimed at solving one problem don't make the other worse. Ideally, they would create positive synergies. The Environment of Peace Report explores options for building peace in this new era of risk based on principles of urgency, fairness and far-sightedness. It makes recommendations that everyone can use, from the United Nations to governments, from financial institutions to civil society. The need is urgent and time is running out. Find out how we can build an environment of peace. So maybe I don't need to, <laughs> to say much more. But I first want to say thank you to, to Norway and uh, to the Norwegian government who has supported this project for your contribution, for Cedric's uh, work. And uh, he has been one of the lead authors of, of the report. And we also have with us Noah Bell, who works at CIPRI and has assisted all of us in helping us in, in this work. It has been a true pleasure and an honor to um, uh, um, chair the International Advisory uh, Panel. And um, I think that uh, it has been very challenging because uh, we started uh, when the pandemic really uh, started. So um, we have not been able to meet. And also with the time differences, uh, you know, I'm joking saying that we were considering sending a ship to Fiji to actually get in touch with them at some time when the rest of us were awake. But uh, um, through uh, the online contacts, we have been able to to also support uh, the work. And we have also been uh, helped by all of these uh, experts that have studied um, and uh, um, written reports on different cases. And the full report, and I think it will be several hundred uh, pages, will, will come out uh, shortly. And I'm sure we will have also a, a, a deep uh, uh, discussion about uh, some of these findings. I was uh, thinking, traveling to uh, Oslo, that um, when, when, you, when you get grandchildren, you become even more interested in the future. <laughs> because you have to. You have to think about what kind of world do we uh, hand over to them and, and leave to them. And uh, I, I think the only honest uh, thing you can say to grandchildren is that the, the world is both a, a wonderful and a terrible place. Uh, to live. And um, I think that it is easy to end up in a doomsday uh, atmosphere to, to help to nurture that kind of doomsday feeling. And of course the doomsday clock has been set on the 100 seconds to midnight. And um, I don't know if they will change it now with, with the war going on. But uh, the thing is we, we kind of live in the age of consequences. Of, of things that we did not take to heart, the things that we did not learn, the uh, actions we did not did not take, and that was the it was the realization of all of that. And of course, at CIPRI, 
Uh, every year they write a report about uh, weapon sales and the, the state of, of the art in, in, in the world when it comes to peace and security. And that is a very bleak picture. And as, you, as you, we heard here uh, on the security front, um, uh, we see increasing uh, risks and a, a very dire situation with with the number of conflicts and, and wars uh, doubling in just 10 years and also the number of deaths because of, of armed conflict. <clears throat> and of course the military spending going up uh, like this even more now with, with the war raging in, in Ukraine. Uh, not only that, but also a crisis for democracy. So uh, democracy is sort of losing ground. We see more of the autocracy spreading and, and that makes also decision making and involving citizens uh, much more uh, challenging, much more, much more difficult. Uh, and at the same time, and maybe a little bit in the shadow of climate change, we see environmental problems also on the rise. Um, I think more, one of the more visible things is, of course, plastic. Um, and the fact that, and as I said, my grandson came to me and said, have you heard that actually there is like a continent of plastic uh, underwater? So in the ocean, there is a new continent uh, formed by plastic. Um, and that's, um, you know, they know these things, uh, but the, the very sort of traditional environmental policies have ended up kind of uh, a little bit forgotten because we talk about climate change, but not so much about what we do to, to the environment. And this project wanted to look at, at uh, all of these uh, uh, challenges, both the security uh, crisis, of course, but also the environmental and climate crisis and the one exacerbating the other and uh, if you um, uh, and, and we can see uh, the links uh, although it is not always casual you know you cannot say that it's the casualty is a hundred percent but you can see a slow development into uh, the, uh, the, the also the development of, of a crisis social unrest uh, often is it starts with that and then it develops into conflict which can lead to an armed conflict or or war so th the climate be became also a, a cat what is what you say in english catalyzer cat yeah. catalyst a catalyst or and an accelerator for conflicts and um, we have tried to deal with it both Norway and Sweden um, during our uh, time as non-permanent members of the Security Council. Uh, and that was a very important uh, realization as well and very difficult, of course, to convince a few of the permanent members that this had to be established as a, a topic and an understanding, but also a method of work. Uh, and what we tried to do was to insist that this should be part of the reporting from the field. So all our UN missions around the world ought to have this on their horizon and scan it sort of regularly and then report back to the Security Council. Um, and at the same time, we needed also a mechanism within the UN system to make sure that we follow uh, the latest of research and that we have the sort of knowledge base and, and research base also for, for what we do. So uh, we managed to, to get this uh, sort of mechanism uh, uh, introduced in, in the UN system and we also managed for the first time to get it in the resolutions, the country resolutions. Uh, so that means, I think, that this is a way to follow up our report as well, to continue with exactly this. Because then we need to train also the UN staff to know what should we look for. And of course water will be, uh, I think, the, the w number one thing. Because we all need water. We are dependent on getting access to, to water. And this is now a, a problem in so many places. Uh, uh, on the planet and um, if we do, do not sort of poison it we uh, overuse it, uh, waste it and, uh, and this is um, I think uh, something that will steer uh, everything else so that's part of course of the, of the report as well to discuss uh, uh, the water problem. 
and security is about our lives and that this the, repo the knowledge about the link has been there for a very long time and actually already in, in 2007 there was an American report uh, from uh, their national, uh, the, from the CN CNA and the Defense Review have also mentioned this um, since 20 years back. So it's not uh, something completely uh, unknown or something that we invented but, but rather trying instead to to understand it better and in depth. Um, I, I think um, what has happened to humanity is that we, we um, think that lifestyle is life itself. <laughs> and maybe this is where we have to, to start to, to rethink. And uh, on this report, the, the background is also that we um, just a week ago uh, celebrated uh, uh, Stockholm Plus 50 because the first UN Environment Conference uh, took place in 1972 in Stockholm. Uh, opened by Olof Palme and of course with, uh, with some with a heritage that um, uh, is, is important, not least with the UN Environment uh, Program, with uh, um, the knowledge uh, and insight of the, the fact that we only have one planet, one Earth, only one Earth, and also that we should do no harm. So a number of principles were established, uh, a, a kind of approach was established, and I think also it created an, an interest in environmental policies that we now have to keep uh, alive. So this is uh, it's what we describe in this um, report, and the background is that we face a twin crisis and a deficit. And the twin crisis has to do with the, what I said, the, the security hori horizon, that is a, a darkening security horizon, and then the multifaceted acute environmental crisis. And just to mention some of these horrendous figures, uh, species extinction is now 10 to 100 times faster than in the last 10 million years. So as far back as we can uh, imagine or study. The biomass loss reached 60 to 75 percent since 1970. So it has been a very quick uh, uh, sort of um, development also. And one third of soil worldwide is degraded. And some uh, researchers uh, think that this could reach 90 percent by 2050. And it creates a human crisis, um, of course. Uh, four billion people experience severe water scarcity around the, the, the world, at least one month uh, each year. And if earlier the rain would come late one year, uh, now the rain might not come. Uh, and this is what happens in countries like Somalia and uh, Ethiopia and, and other places, that uh, they might not have any any rain. And of course that affects uh, harvests and uh, possibility to, to find food. And half of the 40 least peaceful countries are those experiencing also the uh, highest number of ecological threats. And I was thinking, we, we, we talked about that uh, one day, the, the challenges of, of, of this, because in a country like Yemen, and I happen to know a little about uh, Yemen since we, from the Swedish government, uh, um, engaged a lot. But in Yemen, they grow cut, as, as you know, you chew it and it's, it's a drug. And it's only used as a drug. It, they have to use a lot of water to, uh, to grow cut. How do you change that? It's a habit that is sort of generally spread and you get kind of addicted to, to this. So they use so much of their water to actually grow something that is a, a drug that is, does not give food or, or anything. And if they have less water, how to, how to use that and how to change that whole sort of culture these will be some of the enormous challenges for, for a country as, as well. Um, let me w add one more thing about the human crisis because uh, 
We also see that environmental defenders um, get uh, um, they they um, were, are killed, and in 2020, 227 environmental defenders, very often young and indigenous people, um, were killed attempting to preserve their their local environment. So this is also happening as part of sort of democracy being undermined. So, so this is um, um, the, the deficit has to do, of course, with uh, governance. And um, what we are saying is that you have to, we ask from governments everywhere to rethink security and rethink peace. Um, and you have to understand that a healthy planet is also a precondition for stability, prosperity and thus also peace and, and security. And they have to be deliberately inclusive, meaning that you have to engage with groups that will be affected by the decisions that, that you take. Um, and, and that is the, the only way to, to create an, an environment of, of peace. You have to work with uh, especially those uh, uh, aspects of it. Um, so I tried to, I'll t take my s summary because I tried to make a, a, um, a summary of what we, what we want from you who are listening, who are active, who are in the government and, uh, and can make a difference. Uh, we want you to step up. We want you to ensure that measures addressing environmental problems uh, also promote uh, peace and vice versa. We want you to build up, and that is really to um, invest in preparedness and, and resilience and look at risks um, more deeply. And to make transboundary agreements, because this is one example also, or many examples in our report, that you have to work, um, um, cooperate uh, betwe between countries and over, over uh, boundaries. You have to link up, because um, uh, as I said, cooperation is, uh, is needed. And you have to look up, because we have also seen how some of these, uh, uh, um, some of these actions can have uh, uh, negative social impacts and also create risks. And we can see how already in a, on a smaller scale, how um, citizens actually engage against uh, wind power. They don't want any, any of these... Uh, in Snorrena, wind power near where they live. Uh, and how do, you de how do you deal with, with those uh, challenges as well? And you have to pay up, finance peace. And I think this could touch a raw nerve, in both in my country and in Norway at the moment, because I can see that how the debate is going. Uh, we have to finance peace and we have to meet also funding obligations on climate change and uh, environmental issues. Um, and the thing is that so little goes to those countries that need it the most. One eightieth of um, uh, funding of, of, of climate adaption and, and mitigation goes to those countries that need it the most, that are the poorest countries as well in the world. So why did we end up in a situation like that? So countries have to pay what they have pledged and promised. And of course, in the end, never give up, because we don't give up. We also give the good examples in this report of what can be done. And, um, and there are so many of those uh, uh, methods, of the technologies, the knowledge that we have gathered. So it's not hopeless. Uh, and, and that is the thing that... Um, we will never give up. We will continue to work uh, together. And um, I think with this, I'll just hand over to Cedric because, uh, as I said, he was one of the lead authors and he can also go more into detail on some of these uh, elements. But the background is really to say that uh, th we can keep the world as uh, both ha happy and uh, uh, and a rather terrible place. I guess we cannot g get rid of all the problems, but we can we can show a young generation, especially those that are, have followed Greta, and, and they know a lot. And of course, they have not given up because it's it's their future. 
they know what is possible to, to do. I think we have showed it also now that we've uh, both dealt with uh, the pandemic. And of course, the pandemic is also a result of, if we look at the root causes, desertification, uh, the loss of, of um, biodiversity, um, deforestation, all of that brings animals closer to people where they should not be and in an unnatural way. And then these diseases are also uh, transmitted from, from animals to people. And um, we were able to come together. Um, not, not perfect, but we were able to come together to make quick decisions and, and rather drastic decisions. I think the war in, in Ukraine uh, and the Russian aggression has also um, demonstrated um, when we can be at our best and our, our worst. And uh, this is exactly what we have to realize, that there are also good forces and uh, we will need them um, to, to come to join us uh, to create an environment of peace. So thank you uh, for listening to me and uh, Cedric, it's your turn. Thank you very much, Margot. You are such an excellent communicator. It's very difficult to follow in your footsteps. Uh, but I'll just maybe uh, highlight one or two things that, that uh, you have touched on as well, but to emphasize uh, some of the findings that, that, uh, that we have uh, highlighted in the report. And as Margot mentioned, in a sense, the report that uh, we are sharing with you today and that there's copies of is an executive summary, in a sense, of a much larger report, including a number of empirical case studies. Uh, that will come out um, uh, soon as well, for those of you who are more, more interested on the research side of things. But let me just um, maybe say a few words about uh, how this report and work links to what we do at NUPI in this area. So at NUPI, uh, together also with, with CIPRI, our colleagues at CIPRI, we have a project uh, called the Climate Peace Development and Security Risk Project. And it's a project that has actually been established especially to support uh, the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Norwegian government, whilst Norway is an elected member of the Security Council. And the project uh, is specifically focused on generating information and analysis on selected countries that are on the agenda of the Security Council in the form of a series of fact sheets that we produce where we look at what is the research, what is the evidence available about climate, peace and security interlinkages in this country, and then present that in a very short format for policymakers, for those working in the Security Council, but also the larger community in those countries that are affected, uh, and also generate some recommendations. So that's kind of the core product of, of this project so far. We've also on the sidelines uh, generated a number of dialogues, especially with colleagues in India, Africa, China, elsewhere, to, to stimulate more research on this topic across the world. Uh, and we've also created a, a Nordic uh, Baltic climate security network to ensure that in our own region as well, there's continuity of, of, of exchange and exchange of information and research cooperation on, on this topic. So that's why we became involved in, in this environment of peace reports as well. Um, and I think in, in this report, uh, what I wanted to emphasize especially is uh, the, the part that I've been responsible for co-authoring, which is the second part of the larger report uh, entitled The Implications of Climate Change and Environmental Crisis for Peace and Security. So particularly the link between peace and security and climate. And we list uh, a number of specific impacts in the report. Uh, we look at things like the links between human security and hard security and climate change and environmental changes. For instance, in the Arctic region, how the changes that are happening in, in the climate uh, exacerbates and increases tensions in the Arctic region at different levels from people to people to, to strategic level changes. But we also look at uh, human habitability, hab habitability rather. Um, so here we have some of the things that Margaret also mentioned, extreme weather events, uh, increased temperatures, uh, sea level rise, all kind of issues that make some parts of the world uh, less 
habitable for, for different people. And of course that then can generate uh, climate related or environmental related displacement and, 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 and scarcity around conflict, uh, scarcity around resources which can result in, in conflict. And another type of uh, individual health implication is the, zo the zoonotic diseases link that Margaret also mentioned with COVID-19 and other type of diseases. And also the, the way in which, for instance, extreme temperatures can make certain parts of the world uh, uninhabitable for, for humans, or at least certain types of the here as well. And then lastly, we look specifically at resource scarcity conflicts. So here, many of you, thanks so much, may be more familiar with uh, you know, resource conflicts at sea linked to, for instance, fisheries, but also the kind of resource conflicts we see when there's scarcity of, of resources around, uh, for instance, uh, water or grazing, and we have these kind of herder-farmer conflicts that we see in the Sahel or in the Horn of Africa. And then, of course, also, very importantly, transboundary trans water conflicts, like we see in the Nile River Basin and other river basins. So these are all the different types of places where some of these risks appear that we've looked at. And as I mentioned, there's, there's case studies on, on all these uh, different types of, of risks and how they appear. And then we looked at uh, the dynamics of how the interlinkages between environmental degradation, climate change, peace and security. And uh, we identified a number of types of risks. So we talk in the report about systemic risk, cascading risk, compounding risk. And the core thing here that we, that we emphasize, of course, is the extent to which these different um, dimensions are hyperly interlinked and interconnected. Um, and that creates this, this different types of risks. So we have multiple crises happening at the same time. And this is, of course, the kind of core message of the report that Margot mentioned as well. Let me just see here if uh, I'm pressing the right button. So the fact that we have these, these two crises, the environmental crisis and the security crisis at the same time, and the deficit, the governance deficit that we are dealing with. And this creates this, this new era of risk where we have to manage an, an unprecedented interconnectivity and multiplicity of, of crisis. COVID-19, climate change, increased tensions between superpowers, great powers at the moment, uh, unprecedented number of refugees and humanitarian crises, uh, number of uh, uh, increase in, in battle deaths and combats and conflicts and a number of, of intractable conflicts that we are dealing with both in Africa but also Syria, Yemen, we now have the Ukraine conflict as well the weakening of the nuclear disarmament regimes. Um, so a number of conflicts that are happening at the same time and at the same time this environmental crisis that we need to manage. There's a movie on the circuit at the moment, I don't know, a film that if, if you have seen it or aware of it, but I think the, the film is called Everything Everywhere All at Once. And I think that kind of gives this impression of we have to manage all these different things at the same time. and. Uh, uh, when we look at complexity in the context of peace and security, Jean-Paul Lederach, for instance, talks about how complexity emerged from a combination of both multiplicity and simultaneity. And I think this is exactly the dynamic that we see here. And then this is the challenge, the governance challenge that we need to, 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 uh, to manage. And this governance challenge uh, leads us to, to see that we have a gap between the nature of the problem, uh, this highly interconnected problems, and the governance tools at our disposal. Because we, we are organized in institutions uh, that are very compartmentalized, that are specialized and specific aspects. Uh, we are organized in ministries nationally that have these different responsibilities. We are organized as an st international state system where each state is responsible for its own territory and where we are, have great difficulty dealing with either shared spaces like the high seas or cross-border transboundary issues. And also our knowledge systems, our disciplines, our academic disciplines, uh, our academic departments. Uh, at NUPI here itself, we have a, 
several research groups looking at different things and, and even amongst our research groups we could be doing more to understand better how the, the different fact, uh, aspects we're working on, the different disciplines we're working on, the topics we're working on are interconnected. And so this kind of knowledge of how the systems are interconnected and how to analyze that and how to influence that is in a sense what we are lacking both in our knowledge and in the way our governance systems are structured. But a key message of the report is that this complexity, this uncertainty, this unpredictability is not an excuse for inaction. We need to act whilst we at the same time developing knowledge and learn uh, from how we, we engage. And we call this in the report doing whilst learning and, and learning whilst doing. So we need to be, on the one hand, act and even knowing that we don't know exactly what the answers would be, what the outcome would be, but at the same time then very actively uh, follow the process with learning so that we are able to adapt very quickly and improve and change our actions as we go along, as we get feedback and as we learn from our actions which kind of actions are having the effects that we desire and which, which actions are, 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 are less uh, producing effects that are less desirable. And so this then leads us to a number of key uh, principles and findings in the report. And I'll just quickly run through those. So a number of the key principles based on the analysis that I've just shared with you is that we need to think fast and think ahead. And this essentially leads to this adaptive governance concept that I've shared with you that we need much more cooperation uh, uh, amongst not just the like-minded, but, but those who have shared interests, those who realize that uh, they have uh, shared destinies and they share problems, for instance, uh, water resources, uh, um, etc. We need to ex expect the unexpected. As I mentioned, uncertainty is, is, is a part of the reality of our world. We need to to develop our governance systems to be able to manage the, the, un, the unexpected through developing better adaptive governance techniques. And in, that, in this, on our overall focus, as, as Margaret also mentioned, working towards a just, and, a just and peaceful transition. And I think the transition part here is very important because it's not just about climate change and it's not just about environmental degradation, but we are embarking on this radical transition over the next 30 plus years, uh, and that transition itself can uh, cause uh, tensions and conflict depending on how we manage that transition. And this then links us with uh, a number of key recommendations. So invest in preparedness and resilience. Uh, we need to finance peace, not risk. Invest in just and peaceful transitions make the green transition just and peaceful. So don't think of the transition just as something technical, just as something to do with the environment, but it's very important who we engage with, how we engage with key stakeholders in this process, how we are inclusive in the process of the transition. And that's why we have this recommendation about being deliberately inclusive. And then lastly, um, this process of, of adaptation that needs to be fed by at the same time investing in knowledge, uh, in research, in education and information so that we can generate and learn and uh, to, to inform and fuel this adaptation uh, that we need to, to uh, invest in in order to manage this process. So that's the, the gist of our report and uh, I uh, hope that uh, you find this version that you've seen now useful and uh, that you will also, those of you interested in research, look out for the larger report that will follow soon. Thank you very much. Of course, yeah, it's on. Thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me the floor to make some uh, comments on behalf of uh, the State Secretary, um, uh, Henrik Thune. That's really sorry he couldn't be with us uh, today, but he has a doctor's appointment. and he, So I'm, uh, it's a full understanding that that's his priority. So I'm um, going to try to make some remarks that I'm hoping that Henrik would have actually made. Um, 
it's really hard to follow uh, Margot and uh, Cedric, um, but let me try to at least uh, provide a few comments from our side on this work. Um, first, let me congratulate Cipri, Cipri and its partners for uh, the su successful launch of the Environmental Peace Report. I've seen that it has uh, been uh, uh, you've carried a lot of press. I've seen it in uh, lots of newspaper articles around the world, and I think that's a testament to to the great work uh, that has been done. And of course, the subtitle of this report uh, is the security in a new area of risk, and it's a timely description of the current geopolitical situation. Um, and this is something that Margot and also Cedric has dwelt a little bit upon, but the changes that we have seen now in, in the last few months actually is changes that we haven't seen in many years uh, before. And the Ukraine war has set in motion changes that we probably haven't seen since World War II. And Sweden, for instance, and the change in their foreign policy, the same with Denmark and also here in, in Norway. And of course, of course, this comes on the back of uh, the global impacts of the pandemic, which we are still not out of, at least not large part of the world. We behave like we are out of the pandemic, um, but uh, that's not the case. And of course, we have strained relations uh, between US and China playing out. Then we have also India stuck in, in between. A uh, number of state-based armed conflicts has been increasing. We see military spending increasing, cyber attacks, electoral interference raising protectionism on the expense of multilateralism. If I take on my energy hat, the last few months we've been discussing energy security, a topic that was not really high on the agenda before 24th of February. So the two new keywords we are focusing on is actually energy security and just transition. Two years ago we didn't talk about just transition either, uh, but no, this has, been at the, has come to the forefront on our agenda. So uh, I would just like to say to, to my new PNCP colleagues, I'm quite sure that you are working flat out 24-7 to assess what's going on in the world. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we are uh, reading a lot of the, the analysis that we are getting uh, to, to, so we can also stay on top of things. Uh, and of course, it's really difficult these days to follow what's happening. And then, of course, we see the increasing impacts and evidence of the climate and biodiversity crisis. Um, something that hasn't really been brought up squarely in our discussion so far is, of course, that we are very much concerned about how this will affect developing countries. Um, and also, of course, uh, it's being played out in the north, uh, in, in closer to our neck of the woods. But we see that also the rapid changes now are threatening to turn back the development progress uh, that we made. And, and we've seen that uh, the life in many parts of the world is becoming less safe and secure. And of course, this is a huge threat to, to our attempts to, I would say, our attempts to achieve the SDGs by 2030, because it doesn't look good if you look at where we are heading. And of course, we have the Paris uh, targets. So this is a very timely report, um, uh, and I congratulated we, you with the launch at Stockholm Plus uh, 50, the birthplace of multilateral environmental action. I'm also proud that Norway actually took action uh, early. I think we actually established the first Ministry of Environment on the 8th of May in 1972. Uh, when uh, Spec uh, Kerry visited Norway, he it said that probably EPA was, might have been established before uh, our Minister of Environment, uh, but at least uh, we were also early uh, in terms of establishing a dedicated uh, Ministry of Environment. So why did Norway support the, this uh, work? And of course for me also I think it's really interesting to see that you now this report focuses more broadly on environmental issues and not only on climate change. I think to a certain extent we've I've used the term that we've gotten climate change away sometimes. Uh, I used to do water research myself and I've done it for 10 years so I really appreciate it. But uh, you've said about water and now of course I would like to, would have liked to see that higher on our priorities as well. Uh, but for a small country like Norway, of course, we recognize that common threats only have common solutions and it will require global action and we need more multilateral cooperation, not, not less. 
We also know that, and Cedric, uh, you presented this, that environmental change is a risk multiplier for both new and pre-existing sources of tension. So by themselves, of course, climate change and environmental degradation do not create insecurity and conflict. This also depends on the choices we make. And uh, I said we make uh, because I wrote this for my state secretary, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's going to show choices over decision makers make uh, and how we respond to it. So we need to recognize that there are many pathways that can lead from environmental degradation to violent conflict, and you've addressed this in this report, uh, and I think you great, made a really great contribution in enhancing our understanding. I think that was the key premise for us when we decided to support this, because we, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we, also, we need the knowledge that uh, you can help us with. We need to enhance our understanding of the twin security and environmental crisis. And of course, in our discussion so far, we brought up the word crisis now many times. There are lots of crises that we have to deal with, and our decision makers are actually confronted with all of them basically at the same, same time. And we have to help them to, to find a way forward. And I think that through your work, you've actually enhanced our understanding of these complex dynamics. Um, and of course, underpinning this is that we are uh, in the Security Council and climate and security is a key priority for us. Um, so, Margot, uh, let me acknowledge the work that you and your colleagues did on uh, climate and security. You actually put it on the Council's uh, agenda when you brought uh, the Council to uh, Sahel uh, and they could, they could see it for themselves. Then it was hard to come back to New York and say that uh, there's no links. Um, so, uh, so through your work, actually, we've been ma we managed to, to put this on the Council's agenda and we've uh, been trying to, to move it uh, forward. Because climate change is redefining the global security landscape and I think it's fair to say that the national security co uh, community actually took up this issue long before many in the foreign policy uh, system did. Uh, in the U.S., they actually acknowledged this in the early part of this uh, century. Of course, they didn't, at some periods didn't call it climate change, but still, that was the issue that they really addressed. So no nation can actually find lasting security without addressing the climate uh, crisis. Um, and we, from our side, we firmly believe that the UN Security Council should play an important role in addressing issues linked to climate change and the resulting risk for conflicts. And for us also, we know, of course, that the links are contested and we appreciate all the discussions, but we cannot wait until we have all agreed on the links between climate change and security. We need to move forward and we need to address this issue. Of course, being mindful of the fact that there's no full agreement on this issue. We also recognize that climate change is rarely, if ever, the root cause of conflicts, uh, but its cascading effects make it a systemic secu security <laughs> risk. So we will all be uh, forced to respond to the security impacts of climate uh, change. So for us, we need uh, reliable, relevant, timely and actionable information on the climate crisis for specific country situation, and that's where we have established this cooperation with NUPI and CIPRI and also the German Adelphi that has provided us with this knowledge that we need. And we also have established the Nordic Baltic Export Network on Climate and Security that Cedric mentioned. And for us, this is sort of the Norwegian government's legacy to the Nordic and Baltic community. We are wanted to, wanted to leave this export uh, network behind that all of our Nordic and Baltic countries could tap into when they are either bidding for a seat on the Security Council or they are members of the Security Council. And we also support the climate and security mechanism in the UN because we feel it's important to, to increase the UN's knowledge and capacity to address these uh, issues. And I think I would like to underscore for us that the climate and security agenda it is at its heart a preventive agenda. Um, so that's why we are focusing on this. Uh, uh, I'm struggling with my colleagues, uh, some of my colleagues, when we want to talk about climate change because they want to talk about protection of civilians. But for me, this is preventative. It's not when we are in conflict uh, where our agenda is relevant. Um, so, of course, these days the Council is busy with Ukraine, and that means that I'm not busy with the Security Council and climate change because this is not an issue specifically that we are discussing in, in that context. Um, but I'm hoping that 
the research cooperation that you've established now will continue and that the research is involved in the Environment for Peace process uh, will continue to be used to us after the publication of this uh, report. Uh, so we welcome the continued and strengthened cooperation between uh, NUPI and CIPRI because we need your insights. Let me provide a few comments on the report's key recommendations and implications for Norway. First, I think it should be noted this is an issue that you haven't really addressed, but it's linked to the governance deficit because few of our international organizations are well equipped to take joint action on security and environmental issues. We're all struggling to design peace-related development and humanitarian activities to ensure uh, efficiency and effectiveness and implementing a whole of system approach which we are all talking about is ex extremely difficult. We, are, we want to do this to ensure coherence among the development, humanitarian, peace-related actors, but that's easier said than done. You can even look at the Norwegian government. We are also sectorally oriented. We have a small prime minister's office uh, and strong sectors, and sectors are, have difficulties thinking across. We tend to implement and think in the in the various sectors we, where we are sitting. And this is what we've been discussing here, is actually at the heart of it, it's a cross-sectoral issue. And it's really difficult to do that in a, a government uh, system and also in the UN and the international systems. I think this is a, a serious issue for me because we need to do something with the overall institutional setup, create the right incentive to ensure that we get the cooperation we need. And of course, this also plays into uh, that there are different views uh, on this issue on the Security Council when we are dealing with uh, India, Brazil, China and Russia, not small actors. Um, they are not supportive of our agenda. So, of course, we have a hard time. India is now attacking whatever we've done, uh, trying to unravel all our wins in the Security Council, want to change every mandate. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's tough times in New York, uh, actually, for the time being. Uh, as presented by Margot, uh, the report offers six major recommendations. Uh, I will not address all of this, but let me take two examples uh, on the first recommendation to address the linked crisis with joint solutions. Uh, we have the food, energy or fuel crisis that we are faced with. Of course, food insecurity is rising around the world especially in countries reliant on imports. Uh, the World Food Programme has warned that hundreds of millions of people could go hungry as a result, and the Secretary General actually last night uh, uh, launched a new report from his uh, high-level uh, group that is working on, uh, on the Ukraine crisis. And of course, we, could s we see now the risk increasing that it could fuel unrest and political instability. And of course, this is on top then of the socioeconomic tensions that we have in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. So what we will do from our side, we will um, most likely subject to uh, approval by the parliament to increase our support to food security beyond what we have already announced, uh, especially then targeting Africa. The African Development Bank uh, has launched an, an initiative to wean Africa of Russian wheat. We are talking about weaning Europe of uh, Russian oil and gas, but uh, Africa is trying to wean Africa of, um, of Russian wheat. And of course, if they manage to do that, it will have a, lots of positive benef benefits from, uh, for Africa. It will help to reduce imports, improve livelihoods, and support a green transition. And also, it could reduce emissions at the same time. Then coming to Europe, in terms of energy, of course, Europe now needs to fast-track the energy transition to reduce its dependency on Russian oil and gas. In the short term, this will be difficult. It will harm uh, many economies. It will impact industries. And it will also increase the use of sweaters in most European homes. Uh, actually, in my home, at least, uh, I've started using a sweater and we've saved 20, 25 percent of the electricity bill. Uh, so it's actually possible to do it. But in many European homes, it uh, might be a cold winter coming up. So they also need to be prepared. But this is a price that Europe must pay. But a key question, of course, that I think researchers now need to focus on is, is to what, and of course politicians, is to what extent will public support be sustained? Will we actually accept uh, uh, to pay the price? Uh, that's going to be interesting to follow in the coming months. Um, 
From a climate side, of course, emissions will go up in the short to medium term, but I think that's something we just have to accept uh, because I think the energy transition itself, at least in Europe, will go faster. So the forced uh, decoupling from Russia while delivering a sharp short-term shock is, I think it's well uh, within the European strategic objectives. And Europe has the resources to manage, but what about developing countries? Uh, will the energy transi transition be fast-tracked or derailed? I think actually most likely the latter, because my glass is always half empty. I need to, to add that, but I think it's going to be be a challenge in many developing countries because we are facing a risk of a global recession, or at least it will be low growth. It will be, and we see high uh, debt levels in many countries, more risk averse investors. And on the back of this, we already see that last year was the second year in a row when uh, where uh, renewable energy investments in developing countries went down. And of course, it should go up. We get more megawatts uh, per dollar, but we get less dollars. So this is definitely, uh, we're not heading in the right direction. And of course, there's also a strong uh, push in many countries to increase investment uh, in fossil energy resources in response to the Ukraine war. So the solution is of, is, uh, to both of this is a green, just and inclusive uh, uh, transition, which is also a recommendation. And this will uh, reduce the number of environmental tipping points that we risk uh, crossing. It will create new jobs, and I think that is really important that we're focusing on the job creation potential with a just transition. And we also need, of course, on the second recommendation to invest in preparedness and, and resilience. Uh, climate and environment is a key priority for the Norwegian government. We are increasing our support to renewable energy, food security and adaptation. I think it's also important to state from our side is that our first line of defense is, of course, to achieve the Paris targets when it comes to climate change. Norway is also, and together with Sweden, we are the world champions when it comes to providing ODA. Um, so it's a, it's a world championship that we are on, on top. We have also decided to double climate finance by 2026. And even though we are being criticized for maybe having a too low level on climate finance, Norway, Sweden and Germany, we are consistently ranked to the top on the league when it comes to providing climate finance. And in addition, we will double by 2026. So I think it's important to look at uh, the global, global situation here also. Uh, so definitely in this area, Norway is doing her share and in the revised uh, national budget that uh, the, uh, the cabinet presented to parliament, uh, climate finance has not been affected. In fact, it's going to increase if there will be, if this uh, proposal will be approved by parliament. On the recommendation to be inclusive, of course, we fully support that. Uh, for us, ensuring full, equal and meaningful participation of women and youth in all processes is a key priority. This is an issue I could have liked to see strengthened in the report. Hopefully in the full report, uh, there's more uh, on this issue. But uh, I think actually in one of the first drafts I saw that gender was not addressed at all. So uh, at least it's addressed now, but I would like to see that strengthen. We also welcome the clear recommendation on research, education and information. And I happen to have a state secretary who is really interested in, in research. Uh, so I think that's something that uh, you will also benefit uh, from, uh, from, uh, from uh, some new, new uh, proposals that uh, he will present. And we will continue to support uh, the activities that I've already mentioned. And one another issue that is probably not reflected adequately in the report is that climate risk must be addressed in mediation and preventive uh, diplomacy efforts. I think that's an issue that, that we would like now to concentrate on in the last few months that we have on the Security Council. Because I think the shared experience of climate change can be an entry point for building trust and dialogue across communities. Um, and in the report, you've mentioned some good examples of international cooperation on shared natural resources, including transboundary waters, which have helped to build trust and dialogue. Even though, from my perspective, I think you're focusing a little bit too much on the conflict potential rather than the cooperation 
potential. I've always said that water is a source of cooperation rather than a source of conflict, and that's my point of entry. Ismail Sarigeld, uh, the former vice president of the World Bank in the 90s, he put out an ad in the, in the New York Times saying the next wars will be fought over water, and it turned out to be rather on oil and not on water. And I think that's the, where I'm coming from. So this is a source of cooperation. And how can, can we actually use water and transboundary natural resource issue to build trust? Finally, I note that the report gives us uh, and then, uh, just one more issue that I would like to see a little bit more on, and that's on energy. Of course, I know that I started by saying that energy security just transition has really moved up. So I guess that the, the authors of this report, you had to rewrite uh, some, of the, some of the stuff in the last uh, few uh, weeks before publication. But I would have liked to see a little bit more on energy and the implications of the crisis, the energy security issues, the new geopolitical order emerging more government action, so that means that the governments are now taking over rather than the market in terms of, for many, uh, if you look at uh, energy markets. That's linked to the overall governance uh, defi deficit, so I'm hoping that if you haven't finished uh, uh, the full report, that the full report would address some of this uh, issue, and then of course you have the, the bottom line issue is the political economy uh, issue. But I note that the report gives us hope. We have the resources, skills and technologies to address these challenges. We have examples of successes, um, uh, acid rain in Europe, which I think is a very good example where we actually used, since I did water research myself and I was, uh, my colleagues were working on this, was actually science that was behind it, solid science, convinced decision makers to take action. And I think this is the way forward, even though we have the science. I think now it's up to decision makers to act. So before closing, let me again thank CIPRI and NUPI for preparing this uh, important uh, re report. And I think actually, uh, Cedric, you summarized it with a reference to this movie. I think it was everything, everywhere, all at once. And I think that's a good summary of all the crises and issues that we have to deal with these days. Thank you. I invite you to come up here and we'll just move forward these chairs. Um, thank you so much. And now we will have uh, we have uh, 30 minutes for a discussion, um, also Q and A. And if some of you are following this uh, via uh, or stream, uh, you can send uh, your questions there as well. Let me just say that it's a bit frustrating uh, uh, if we had labeled this seminar. Uh, energy and war, or fossil oil and war, it would have been a packed auditorium. Now it's called environment and peace, and very few people are here. <laughs> uh, uh, and this is, of course, uh, sad in some sense, because uh, I think that this report addresses uh, two very, uh, not trivial, but existential problems for humanity. It's about environment. It's about peace. Uh, and this is something that is not uh, theoretical, not uh, in the future. It's uh, very local, it's present, it's uh, affecting every day's life, and it's actually on the top of every individual's list of basic needs. Uh, and I also would like to say that to, to Margot and to the team who has prepared this report, I approached this first as I thought it would be about climate, but uh, I learned throughout this process that this is about this is about environment, and I think it's really important. There's so much thing is written about climate, uh, very important, good stuff uh, on the climate. But the way this report brings up uh, environmental issues about biodiversity that is well well beyond the climate. I think it's really important. So we address these two things. Now, uh, I don't want to have a long intervention, but I think that the, uh, it, it, this report addresses, I think it gives us two very important points. The, the first is that we cannot have solved the environment challenge without peace. Uh, and, uh, so that's the first uh, <laughs> very trivial insight, but very important. And the second is that we cannot have peace without environmental kind of health, some kind or the other. So that's the, 
Uh, that's where we are heading. We have to achieve both of these two things. And the second is that this report gives us some very important insights onto the, into the transition. Basically saying that, that in the transition, we have to make sure that this transition to promote the environment is unfolded in a peaceful way. Uh, and secondly, that, uh, that we cannot uh, secure peace without an uh, environmental transition. Right, so the, these are very trivial, but very important insights. Um, and then, of course, the report is filled up with lots of stories saying that we are not faring well, we are not performing well, neither on the environment indicator or on the peace and conflict indicator. But there are lots of optimism that, uh, yes, uh, we can take some steps, we can move in the direc direction, and by the way, we don't have any option. We have to do it. Now, um, so uh, again, uh, this is, I think, it's a, it's a good read, in the sense that it's, it's, it's attractive, appealing text. You can look into it, it's beautiful layout, and so not only the authors, but also the people who have pre prepared the graphics and all this have done a great job. I want to ask one question to you, Margot, to kick us off. Uh, you asked me to have another question, but I, I just want, as a point of clarification, because now we are sitting here in Norway, all white people sitting here, uh, but it's not a report prepared by people in the Northwestern Europe. You, uh, and in the report, uh, it's not systematic data all over the place, but anecdotal evidence from all over the world. So could you say something about how we have dealt with the north, south, east, west divide, etc., in preparing the report? I think it's important. It's a global report. Yes. Please. Well, oh, thank you very much. Um, and we have been um, much aware of, of that uh, perspective. And uh, I think we can say also when... Uh, first of all, the composition of, of this advisory group, uh, definitely from all around the world. And uh, I think also with experts and uh, all the people involved, I, I would say that it is not, uh, it doesn't look like this, <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. us, but, but much more sort of mixed and, and inclusive. And, and that's a very important point. And one more thing, uh, and I think Cedric can maybe speak to that, but I have been very insisting on... Um, to have the very concrete examples because you know these most of the time these reports have a very short shelf life you know a, a couple of years and then it's sort of it has just gathered dust somewhere we don't want it to be that kind of report and it is important how we now follow up and make sure that uh, it is implemented and used to, to the full. And then we need also to, ha to have been engaged with so many different uh, actors. So I, I, I'm sure that we can, with the help of CIPRI and all of you who have also financed this project and been active in the project, that you can help to make sure that, that, that it happens that way. Um, and I, I took to heart all, all of the things I, I noted carefully also, some of the things that you would have liked to see described uh, better or more. Uh, and uh, so I, th I think th those are all, uh, all valid uh, points. And um, I'm, I think um, I've learned something in, in, a, in a conference here in Norway uh, a number of years ago, and I think actually it was so long back, it was, I, I was environment commissioner, and I came here to discuss climate change. And um, at that conference here in Norway, there, there were, it um, turned into a debate about the fact that climate change is addressed by sort of natural scientists. Um, uh, the experts uh, come from, from that sectors. But um, a woman uh, stood up and said, well, I think we should uh, um, call on the behavioral scientists instead to help us understand why are we not capable of acting on the mm. research that we already have. We know exactly where climate change is taking us. It has been stated in consecutive reports from the IPCC, etc. Why are we not? And, uh, and the woman said, and there were, there were psychologists uh, as well, and she said that for, for people to, 
to act. Um, they need to be able to imagine this as an enemy, as, an, as something that takes shape as an enemy. And until then and until now, it has been looked at as something that will happen later on, in the future. We will see climate, the effects of climate change. And it will happen to somebody else, somewhere else. And only now do we feel it also on our skins and we understand that it is affecting us uh, as well. And, and this is when we are starting to, to, to look at it seriously. But I still think we lack that kind of insight and also the urgency. Because again, to return to my grandchildren, it will affect their lives. It will be in the middle of their lives when they see the full effects of this. And they will have a very different reality to, to live in. Mm. So I, I think this is also part of, of all of this. So how do we, uh, how do we make people, this is why I said, ask me about the implementation. <laughs> I, want to, I planted a, a question. <laughs> Because okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, want, I want some countries to say we are willing to become pilot countries for this. We, 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 I would like to see a few countries that we can sort of start with and really implement it in a much serious way. And I think then we have to help countries, rich countries like Sweden and Norway. And hopefully we will be there. We will be present. We will have a diplomatic presence as well as the UN system to help governments that really take, take this to heart and to understand that they have to, to start somewhere to implement it. And of course, then I want all countries to, to take the message seriously. And you can start with the easy things, and that has to do with uh, education and training and information. Uh, um, and I think not all countries have a, a, a proper um, education and training in sustainable development, for example. That is not a subject in, in many countries at, at all, or environmental, to, to teach about uh, the environment uh, at school. And you have to start with children because they are the best ambassadors then. They will keep an eye on their parents, as you know. They, you, know you have to sort the waste and you have to do this or that. You cannot smoke, you know, they tell us all, uh, all things uh, important. So I, I, I think this is something that every country can, can do. And then you have to, to sort of build on that and make sure that they understand fully. And what you do, what you're doing now also in the Security Council to follow up, I think is another very concrete example. If we train the UN staff to understand what they have to keep an eye on, then uh, we can succeed in getting it, keeping it on the Security Council's agenda and not only that, but developing it. Because most of the peacekeeping missions are in countries that also have the most in, of, of environmental problems and are mostly affected by climate change. It's not a coincidence, as we say. This is not a coincidence. This is how the, mm. the link is e expressed in every day. And you had an ambassador, I, I will finish with that, but you, we had a Swedish ambassador to Norway once upon a time by the name Rolf Edberg, and he's one of my big idols in life. He's really a role model. And he wrote the most beautiful thing that has ever been said about water. And I, maybe you have it, that quote from him, when it says it's the same, to understand the life cycle of water. He said that the water you drink from a small river creek in, in the north of Norway of Sweden is the same water that has rained down over the the Amazons that has been in the bathtub of, of Cleopatra, that has <laughs> been passed through the cooling system of a nuclear power plant, that has been carried in clay vessels over the deserts of the Middle East, the same water in the eternal uh, life cycle. So uh, I think this is, uh, again, to give us an understanding of where we are in the whole in this whole system, and to understand that also shows uh, uh, us our responsibility, I think. Okay, so if some of you would like to join in the conversation, please raise your hand. <laughs> but Cedric, would you like to <coughs> say a few words to what Hans Hula, his remarks and uh, reflections? Uh, <coughs> and, uh, I'm actually think it's more important to move over, maybe, yeah. maybe to give people a chance to, to, to engage. Let me just add to the one thing that, that what Margot said is that the intent is now with this report to go all over the world and so there will be meetings in, in, in Africa, in the Middle East, in Latin America, in Central Asia, in, 
in, in China and, and elsewhere in India, uh, where we will engage with the researchers, some of the colleagues who were on the international panel. And so the whole idea is that this will also help to kickstart further conversations across the globe. Just a small comment, uh, because you mentioned uh, you try to be sort of all-inclusive uh, when it comes to examples from around the world, and I think that's exactly what we need, uh, because a lot of the stuff that we are looking at these days um, in terms of various scenarios, especially on the energy sector that I'm following more closely, and also in, in climate change, we look at global benefits and we of course estimate all the trillions that we will benefit from this transition. But for me, it's always about winners and losers. We can, will not, all of us, win. Uh, we will not get all these trillions, all of us. Uh, there will be some getting the trillions and some will lose out. So I think increasingly we need to downscale this to the national and sub-national level. I just came from Indonesia. I was told that in a local community there, 70% of their income is dependent on a coal mine. It's really difficult to transition out of the coal mine into something new that they are not really aware of. So this is something that at least I would like to see that we are now starting to drill down and to ensure that this actually relates to uh, the local people. Uh, jokingly, when you said also uh, the children, uh, Margot, when I came out to my home office uh, to, and went up to dinner one day and my kids asked me what I've been doing today and I managed to get climate change included in a UN security resolution. It didn't really... <laughs> Uh, they said, great, Dad, <laughs> what, what, what will be the implications of that? Um, but anyway, uh, so my, my, the point I'm trying to make here is I think it's also we need to focus increasingly on thinking locally and acting locally. I think then it will uh, end up in good global benefits uh, because just thinking globally will not necessarily spur local action in my personal view. And a final one, I think there are one in terms of just transition, some groups, and you know this, Margaret, because you're a politician, or at least you used to be a politician, some groups have a lot of political influence. So one told me that we need to make sure that farmers, soldiers, miners, and then someone added fisher folks, they have to be well taken care of in any transition. They are sort of marginal uh, in many countries from an economic perspective, but politically, they have a lot of influence. And those are the groups that we also look at uh, when we have to focus on just transition because there are groups that can derail all our efforts. Can I just uh, say something to that? And I, I don't know if Cedric uh, uh, agrees with me, but I, I must say that in everything we've done, in every discussion, and as sort of formulating some of these principles and recommendations and so on, the whole issue of, of being inclusive and meaning that you cannot make these changes unless you engage with the miners or the, the fishermen or the, and of course women, I would say, everywhere, because unless we say it, they will, people will think, well, we can do that later. And, it, you know, so I, I think you have to, throughout, and I also believe that we have to, so, so you're so right to, to point that out, but I also believe that in presenting the report, I think we always should use some very um, practical examples the, uh, and country examples. What does this mean then for a country like uh, uh, Ethiopia or, or whatever country? What does it mean? What do we ask from them? What is it that they can do? Uh, because that makes an impression also on, on people. We, we understand it better. Uh, and as you said, it's an interesting take. You don't, if we think that water would be the, the main source of, of conflict, it can also be the best way to cooperate uh, across borders. But uh, the, the Gerd Dam, I often use that because I remember my Egyptian colleague, every time he met me, he was talking about the dam. And he said that, you know, if, they, if there is less water in the dam and if Ethiopia does not um, open uh, sort of the gates so that we can get the water from the Blue Nile, 
there will be war. <laughs> you can be sure that there will be conflicts. But instead, we need to create that kind of knowledge and systems that can give them the best of help and support to provide water management and water management plans, not only there, but in many of these places. And I think that is, of course, a theme for the researchers as, as well and good examples. But we have to... I think we have to come down to the, those concrete examples. OK, now I have a question here. Please, uh, sir. Uh, Jörnik, we'll give you the microphone. Yes. Yeah, my name is Svein Flåte, an engineer with an interest in the state of the world. Thank you so much for the presentation and the report. I browsed briefly through it. I look forward to looking into more detail. You mentioned the root cause analysis, Margot, and also cooperation and win-win-win-lose was mentioned. I've been working with root cause analysis industry for a quarter of a century. It's very important to really find a root cause. And I believe that maybe an important root cause could be the lack of um, self-determination for girls and women in developing countries, leading to population increase. The Norwegian Refugee Council showed up 10 refugee crises now in the Sahel area. Those countries increased from 114 to 560 million people during my life age, which is 60 years, I must admit, but still in a quite short time. And I think that could be also an area for cooperation and also an area for win-win. If we could give them less child marriages, less children in the marriage, and more self-determination. I would like to have your comments on that. Word, sir, that is absolutely... That's um, something that I keep uh, saying all the time. This is the reason why I, I started the feminist foreign policy, because the, this is the insight. And especially if you travel like the, to the Sahel countries, and you know that in Niger, uh, for example, every uh, a, a woman gives birth to on average uh, seven children. And if they are married away when they are like uh, 15, uh, and even, sometimes even younger, 15, 16, and they give birth to seven children, they will never get back into school. And of course, they can never fight poverty. They will remain in poverty. So to offer... Uh, girls' education, that is actually the start of, of changing the world. And, and we need to do that, especially in those areas where there are so many examples of child marriage. So I, I totally agree. And uh, we just have to insist on, on this in everything we do. And I think also we have to steer more with the money also that we provide and with, with development. We have to make sure that the, this is part of, of our plans also for for giving uh, help and, and assistance and uh, development assistance. Now I have a few questions. We have only six or seven minutes left, so but let's collect. Uh, so first, here, please. Hello, my name is Mona Vernes. I work with Norwegian People's Aid, Norsk Folkehjelp. And um, uh, you mentioned uh, who's affected the most um, and also uh, like to include everyone. And we actually did a mapping of our partners. We work all around the world. Uh, with development and humanitarian aid, uh, and we did a mapping of uh, do they work with environment and climate, and how do they work? Because we don't, we are not an environment organization. We work with international aid, and what we saw that most of our partners actually do engage in environment, and why? Because it's their life. It's for local farmers, it's indigenous peoples, it's fishermen, it's uh, women, and it's about um, that they see. The, uh, most of them say that we see the changes now, and we act. And they don't talk much about climate change and uh, cutting emissions. That's like your job up in north. They talk about adoption and how they do it in detail. And we, I was a bit surprised because they actually also, a lot of them mentioned water. I'm like, we don't do water, but water is so essential to so many things like irrigation or clean water and, and also the right to water and who's deciding over the water. So I just wanted to mention that because I think that's an important aspect and actually also lead to a question <laughs> to MFA and um, as you I have been mentioned now like the third um, recommendation is finance and, and Norway has been in forefront on many and many things and I think it's important to see the connection between cooperation with local organizations around the world and not just uh, people individuals or, or cooperatives but also uh, co uh, or, or business but also with organizations but because what we see that when organizations work together with local farmers uh, we see that food security is improved right so 
I want to ask if this is like important for the government now, why do we do the cut in aid in the budget? Because to me it is related both to peace and also to environment and even more that maybe we think, uh, and this was just a one mapping we have, but it was like really interesting findings. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then uh, pass on the microphone to Hi. you, please. Uh, Ingun Mekine from Plan International. Um, I think you said many of the things that I wanted to ask. Uh, and it's, it's clear that we, we agree here in the audience because, um, m well, where do I come from? I work uh, particularly with uh, girls and young women in the Sahel, uh, fa uh, working uh, to address child marriage, uh, sexual and gender-based violence, and we see that this, the environmental crisis is, is having such a dire effect on, on uh, particularly young girls and women. Um, and I, I know that you're saying that we shouldn't give up, but I sometimes feel that we're putting a very small band-aid on, a, on an, a huge wound uh, that will not heal. Um, and now we are facing um, proposed cuts in particularly sexual and uh, reproduction, uh, reproductive health and rights, as well as education. Um, what are your thoughts on this? If, if this is important to you, <laughs> why? Um, and also, in, in from an NGO point of view, how, how, can, how can we, what can we do um, to, to address this issue? Because, as I said, the Band-Aid is very small. Uh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> just, uh, uh, I think that, uh, just, uh, Anzulov, you, are, uh, you, you should That's be prepared to respond to this, but I think yeah. that it would have been more appropriate if Henry Tuna, as a politician, was here. Uh, just, uh, but, I, but, uh, he, he... Could I just yeah, say yeah, the answer? No, nah, because we'll bring in one more question. Yeah, Kari? Okay, Kari, one of my colleagues. Have, she is, so then we have a few minutes to talk about budget. The answer also. is that this is being decided by someone with a higher pay grade than me. <laughs> I think that that is the answer I can provide. I don't want to, of course, you fully understand that I cannot comment upon this and we'll wait and see what will happen in Parliament. I think it is very important to so. create some public opinion against and, and to turn this around. I feel ashamed. I feel ashamed of my own government doing this. Uh, and I don't mind saying it, I'm a free person now, uh, so I can, I can say whatever, but I really try to work also with the people I know, because I, I, I don't think that this was, uh, was the deal to, uh, uh, in, in those difficult times that we, uh, we let those, um, the poorest uh, people pay. And, uh, I just, and it has created an uproar in the UN system and, and all of those who are dependent on, on our support. And I'm not saying that we, we cannot follow the uh, ODA rules, we can do that, we've done that before, but to go above that and, and uh, to do uh, what I think both our countries uh, governments are, are doing, I, I don't like it. And I think you have to, to show some of the, uh, the consequences. Um, you, you have to, to uh, give the examples of how this will affect your... But uh, can I just jump in and again uh, just say that I fully understand your point. But at the same time, your point is, I think, some of the key points of this report. The fact that we have unpeace, war, in one part of the world kind of creates a demand on uh, some uh, kind of resource allocation that has kind of negative effects on other things. So it shows the link between, on the one hand, peace or unpeace or war and environment. That we need, because we need to kind of address our resources differently. We need these resources with the element of urgency. And then, of course, you should say uh, that we should spend more. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I think that hopefully the parliament will will approve of that, so we can spend more. But there's this link between war and, and the environment. And this is a dilemma because we need to invest in prevention and resilience yeah. for the next uh, conflict and precisely for the cycles that we see in terms of potentially the Ukrainian conflict, the impact on food security and, and how that could impact on, on more, more conflict in places like the Sahel. But one other point that I think is important is when we think about the transition 
and its impact on, for instance, the communities you mentioned in the Sahel and elsewhere and their development, because it's not just about development aid and education, but it's really the economic growth, the industrialization in those countries. That's the path that changed the role of women in our societies in the north. And that's the path that will also change the role of, of women and girls in Africa. And so this just and peaceful transition is very important because we should not manage the transition in such a way that deny those communities from going through a similar developmental path. This, this is the, the trip that has made the most impression on me to travel to Sahel. Um, and I did it with the UN um, leadership as, as well. And uh, to first of all, to see how the, the lake, um, Chad, uh, has, of course, um, sort of shrunk uh, so dramatically. And now it's the women who do the fishing. Because, and the women themselves said, you know, before when the lake was big, the fish were big. Now the lake is small, so the fish are small. And we are the only ones that uh, can take care of those small fish. We have the sort of patience and, the, and we found a system to actually take care of also the smallest fish. But our nets are so bad. We have to sort of mend them all the time. And I remember Amina Mohammed being so upset. Why on earth are these women not given sort of proper nets so that they can do the fishing? But they have had invented a system of taking care of making food out of, the, of these the very small fish. So it, and it changes the whole society, of course. And it could be a, sort of an industry if they were given the right tools to, to, to do the best out of that situation. But instead, it was more, sort of more poverty and more difficult for, for everybody. But for women, a new role. Um, and, and I think that this is and creating all of these uh, uh, conflicts between uh, uh, herders and farmers and so on. So I, I, I think to understand those links, and this is why it ought to be a message also to our governments that they have to rethink and uh, balance better. Okay, so uh, see, time is running out. So uh, thank you so much, Margot Wallström, for your leadership and, uh, and uh, coming here to present this report. Uh, and thanks to Cedric, of course, for his contributions, and to Hans Olaf for stepping in an excellent manner uh, for uh, Henry Tuna, and also ducking the difficult questions that we get from the <laughs> audience. But uh, I fully understand and respect that, of course. And thank you to all of you who have showed up, and to those who you have followed this uh, stream as well. Uh, let me also, as indicated by, by Cedric, uh, not only do we have, uh, together with Elizabeth and others sitting here, uh, doing this UN project, we've also created a new research group on climate and uh, energy transition. So this is uh, the whole aspect of our environment, climate, peace and conflict, energy transition, is occupying a lot of the resources at NUPE. So we will continue to do that. So stay tuned and, and uh, please follow our work on that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.